Okay, guys, part two of the video here. Let's try to get through this as quickly as we can. I don't want to waste too much of your time. Number 36. Which legislator was responsible for helping negotiate compromise over slavery and tariffs to help postpone the Civil War? Remember, that was Henry Clay, one of the old war hawks from the War of 1812. He's now uh, the Speaker of the House. He also tried to run for president. He's a guy who was part of the corrupt bargain that helped John Quincy Adams win the election of 1824 over Andrew Jackson. Um, he'll never become president because that corrupt bargain thing that Andrew Jackson kept throwing at him, that's going to stick to him through the rest of his career. But he was a great compromiser and helped the United States stay together, at least uh, on a temporary basis, until the Civil War eventually arrives. Uh, number 37, which two countries reached an agreement that Adams owned his tree? That is the United States and Spain. Uh, remember, the United States in this agreement buys, Spain, uh, buys Mexico from Florida, or buys Florida from Mexico, from Spain, basically, uh, for $5 million, and in return agrees to remove their claims to, to Texas. So the Spanish are allowed to take Texas and as part, as, a part of, as part of Mexico. Uh, Age of Jackson notes, Andrew Jackson's main complaint about the Bank of the United States was that it was keeping the wealthy people wealthy while keeping the poor people poor. Since he was a man of the people, he was a common man himself, um, raised up from truly the bottom, he hates the Bank of the United States and tries to destroy all things is unconstitutional. We talked about the corrupt bargain already. Make sure you know the names of people involved. Number 40, the old supporters of the Federalist Party, they begin to call themselves the Whigs. So Andrew Jackson, he was a Democrat or Republican, but after the corrupt bargain in 1824, he doesn't want to be a part of the Democrat or Republicans anymore because he feels like they cheated him out of this election. So he breaks off, forms his own party called the Democrats. Uh, and then eventually, some of the old Democrat or Republicans are going to form uh, a party called the Whigs. They're going to splinter off there. So it's not going to be the Democrats and the Whigs versus each other. Uh, number 41, what was the most important factor in the expansion of democracy that helped Jackson win the election of 1828? So between 1824, when he lost, and 1828, when he wins, m almost every state in the United States removes the property voting requirements in order to vote. Remember, you used to, you used to have to be a white man who owned property to vote. Well, now you used to be a white guy, but you don't have to own property more. So now more of the common men get a chance to vote. Since Andrew Jackson is, is their politician, he sees himself as one of them. They love him. They're going to vote for him in record numbers and help him win the election of 1828. And that's going to bring greater democracy to the United States. More people get a chance to participate in the government. Uh, number 42, the issue behind the tariff crisis was basically uh, a new tariff was added to the United States. They raised tariffs to almost 40%. So to give you an idea what that is, if you buy something from a foreign country for $1,000, you're going to pay $400 in taxes on that. So that's going to stop a lot of people from buying things from foreign countries, make it more likely that they'll buy it that same good from American companies. That helps people up north because they're the manufacturers that people are going to be buying goods from. But it hurts people down south because they have to trade with Britain. They have to grow their cotton and their other crops and trade those overseas with European countries, particularly Great Britain. So when the United States puts a tariff on trade with foreign countries, those, tra those countries will then do the same thing to us, put a tariff on our goods. That hurts the south. So long story short, tariff good for the north, bad for the south. So the southern states, particularly South Carolina, are threatening to nullify, there's that word again, cancel out the tariff and not to follow it because they feel like it's unconstitutional and it also favors the North and hurts them. So they're threatening to nullify that law and even starting to threaten to secede possibly if this tariff is not removed. Andrew Jackson responds to all this by threatening to use the military to invade South Carolina if they don't follow federal laws. And it kind of establishes even further the supremacy of federal law over states. So it's kind of a states' rights versus federal law issue here. Uh, number 43, what caused the Panic of 1837? Remember, Andrew Jackson hated the Bank of the United States, so he tried to destroy it. And by taking action to destroy the Bank of the United States, he really ends up causing an economic recession. People start losing money, banks start losing money, and it leads to a panic, which is a, a recession, of 1837. So not good for the economy. Uh, number 44, what are three changes Jackson made to the practices of previous presidents? So when we talk about Jacksonian democracy, bringing more people into the government, more or greater level of democracy, there's a couple of things he did. He started the spoil system where he's going to spoil his supporters by giving them jobs when he wins the presidency, giving them jobs in the government. He's also going to start this idea of rotation in office where you don't just give someone a job and them keep it forever. Uh, give them the job and keep it for a year or two and you're going to rotate them out and move them along and move someone else in there because he did not want people to get too powerful. He was afraid that at, that if you had too much power, it would corrupt you. So he wanted to um, make sure that didn't happen. And he also used what he called the kitchen cabinet, which is his like, unofficial group of, group of advisors, like his, his close friends that were going to advise him on what to do as president. So instead of relying on the professionals, um, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, guys who really were experts at their fields were supposed to be, 
He relied more so on his friends for advice in making the decisions that he made as president. Number 45, why did Andrew Jackson and his supporters support the removal of Native Americans from the South? Remember, they found gold in the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains of Jordan, North Georgia, particularly the city of Dahlonega. It just happened to be that land belonged to the Native Americans, Cherokee. So to get that gold, to get that land, they had to remove the Cherokee from that land. Uh, manifest destiny, notice where the term manifest destiny means to the, is the destiny of the United States to spread west to the Pacific Ocean. 47, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was the treaty that ended the Mexican-American War and gave the United States all the Mexican session lands they get. From that war, uh, and just also be able to identify the process of westward expansion. Think about uh, the gas and purchase when we added that, trying to build a railroad to the west. That was the last major pur purchase that we made in terms of land. The uh, conflict in Oregon with the British, where we agreed to draw a line at the 49th parallel, basically cutting the Oregon Territory in half, and the British taking the upper half, the Americans taking the lower half. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase, of course, the annexation, uh, the annexation of Texas in 1845, if they won their independence from Mexico. So all those things. And the last thing we talked about this in class today, the social developments were also going on this time period as well. Um, the Irish are the immigrant group that comes to the United States in the greatest numbers. Largely they're coming because of a potato famine, which killed over a million of them around 1840 to 1850. And conditions in Ireland were just terrible for them. They were kind of treated as slaves in their own land by the British. The temperance movement focuses on outlawing the uh, sale, production, and consumption of alcohol. They were concerned that men were wasting all their paychecks on that and not providing for their families, coming home drunk and abusing the, their wives and children, um, just moving. It was really kind of a Christian movement as well. And women were focused on this movement because they were the ones being abused by the by their drunken husbands. Number 51, who worked to establish mandatory elementary education for all white children? A guy named Horace Mann, who really kind of created the modern system of education that we have in the United States. Again, that name is Horace Mann. And the last one, what particular right did the women's rights movement work to gain for? They were fighting for the right to vote. Now, of course, they want all the rights that men have, but the first one they want is the right to vote because they feel like if they get the right to vote, all the other rights will come from that because they can elect people who support them or sympathetic to them and will help them help pass laws that will give them more rights than they were previously getting. And that this all starts, the, women right, the women's rights movement, again, starts at the Seneca Falls Convention with women like Elizabeth State, Katie Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and the Grimke sisters as well. All right, guys, hope that helped. Uh, good luck tomorrow. Come in and let me know if you have any questions when you get here in the morning.